We are in the very last days of summer. Autumn is right around the corner. That will be early Saturday morning. At that point, the days will be exactly 12 hours long, although there will be some variation due to the size of the solar disk. Also, yeah, out there to the right, Hurricane Nigel, a high-end Category 1 storm. Let's go ahead and take a look at the weather map. Yeah, there it is. Go ahead and wave bye-bye to that storm. It's heading to the north-northeast, getting picked up by the prevailing westerlies, located about 750 miles southeast of Nova Scotia. And it is moving rapidly to the northeast and should be south of Iceland by this weekend. So with that out of the way, let's take a look at the surface map for this afternoon. We're going to focus on the air masses. We've got the tropical air mass right there across Texas. You can see the dew points are close to 70 degrees, 65 to 70. In between, we've got this little stagnating front. And north of that, temperatures in the mid-80s with dew points a little bit drier, looking at 50s. And, yeah, you've probably noticed this thing. Looks like a big, kind of like a thorny crown or something. That is a meso high with a outflow boundary that's certainly mesoscale in size, pushing outward and producing this little ring of showers and storms. There it is on the satellite imagery, kind of a complicated structure. I do see one boundary right here, another one about like that, and convection back behind it and along the leading edge. It looks like a little mesoscale convective vortex right there north of St. Louis. All right. Returning to the surface map, a dry line from just east of Pierre, down to about Dodge City, Childress, Sand, down to the Pecos River. West of that boundary, temperatures in the 80s, dew points in the 30s, and then we hit that new outbreak of cold air up there in the Pacific Northwest. Temperatures back there in the 50s, a very cold day, at least for this time of year, some showers near that cold core low. And that corresponds to the center of that cold air mass. We're going to see that cold air mass move into the Great Basin region tomorrow, into the eastern Great Basin region for Friday, crossing the Rockies and then out into the plains. And it will be modifying as it crosses that very warm ground. You can see the temperatures south of that front in the 70s and 80s. And if we roll it back to yesterday, you can see how warm it was, 75 at Pocatello and 74 at Cody. So the air mass is being warmed from the bottom up. And when you start involving all this cold mid-level air, that's going to set up some steep lapse rates and some instability. And there's what we're talking about. This is the 700 millibar chart for this evening. The red lines indicate isotherms. And you can see how it drops sharply from 10 degrees at Salt Lake City, that's going to be about 50 Fahrenheit, down to minus 5 at Clarkston in the Snake River Valley. Minus 5, that's going to be about 23 Fahrenheit. So some rather dramatic cooling as you go northwest, and that helps bring showers into the forecast. You get those steep lapse rates and instability even back behind the front. Set up to Alaska. Well, the Gulf of Alaska is still active. Occluded system approaching Anchorage and Valdez, a triple point well offshore, and that's going to be the more potent area for rich moisture. That's the warm conveyor belt. Moving on up into Yakutat, Juneau, and Haines. And in the interior, temperatures in the 30s and 40s with snow just north of the north slope. In Canada, continued cold temperatures starting to get into those 20s around Ellamere Island, Found some of the first snow I've seen at Thule this season, 29 degrees with moderate snow coming down. And in central Canada, that wildfire smoke still continues, concentrated in northwestern Alberta. So that's going to be near White Court, maybe around Valley View, and on up to Peace River. Most of the smoke remaining in Alberta and Saskatchewan. And some Advected smoke coming across Quebec, but not restricting visibilities down at the surface. All right, so that brings us full circle. So an outgoing polar air mass across the northeastern U.S., rather modified temperatures in the 60s and 70s. Our return flow coming up north, 
broken up by the solid frontal boundary down to the south, and then the approaching weather system coming in from the North Pacific. And that brings us to the National Hurricane Center forecast. They are focused on the Cape Verde area. That's the classic hurricane track that would affect the Leeward Islands and Puerto Rico and another area right along the southeastern U.S. coast near Florida, south of North Carolina. Let's break that down and look at the GFS. All right, so this is going to be the latest data that I have. The burnt orange and red colors, those are vorticity, a great way of finding disturbances. And you can certainly see the intertropical convergence zone right there, along with tropical waves flowing out of Western Africa. It's a great chart, isn't it? Love looking at this. And there's Nigel departing the weather picture. All right, so let's go forward into tomorrow evening. Already got a closed low coming together, so by tomorrow night, NHC may be identifying a tropical depression or a tropical storm. And yeah, right there near the Bahamas, a tropical disturbance rapidly coming together. Not expecting that to grow very much, but uh, let's go ahead and move forward into Friday. That's going to be 48 hours from now. Yeah, both of these coming together. These are going to be Ophelia and Philip. So look for those names over the next couple days. Let's go into the weekend. Things moving along pretty steadily. We've got landfall there in Virginia over the weekend. And this other disturbance continues to march to the east, but it's going to be kind of a long process. You can see it's finally arriving in the Leeward Islands around Tuesday and Wednesday. So we're looking at six days down the road, and that means a lot of margin for error. The models have been taking the track further and further south. Originally, they were kind of like this. So that is a trend we've been seeing, and that could threaten the Gulf or Florida, depending on how this works out. And there's another little wave right there that we'll bear watching. But again, this is about 150 hours down the road, and that's that's crystal ball territory, but we'll just take you through that. This other one looks like it's moving north, so we'll see about that. Meanwhile, the other storm there near Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic continues moving to the west. And that's the latest chart I have for September 30th. So it looks like that could be a factor for Cuba, the Bahamas, Jamaica. A lot of unknowns at this point. Let's see how the old moisture supply is looking. This is the precipitable water. We've got purple values indicating an inch and a half up to two inches around Florida, the Gulf of Mexico region, and a plume of lesser amounts working its way up the plains and supporting some of that thunderstorm activity there in Oklahoma and Arkansas. Let's take a quick look over the next couple of days. You can see that system there in the Great Basin area is a little bit dry, so not a huge spread of thunderstorm activity, although as that comes out of the Rockies, it's going to interact with this moisture, and we will see the precipitation areas expand and the appearance of severe weather on the plains, and that's going to be probably for Friday. And that's how things look for Friday afternoon. Definite cyclogenesis out there in Kansas, the Interstate 70, Interstate 80 corridor. Some indication of cyclonic wrapping of that moisture probably will involve a dry line extending south and the front itself that appears to be roughly in this region right there. So some weather coming together in about two days on the plains and as well out there along the east coast. That's our next system. We'll back that up. You can see that approaching from the south coming together and moving on shore for Friday. And just kind of skirting the coast as it moves up and bringing a plume of one and a half inch precipitable water into the northeast corridor. So here's where we're at this evening. Can't really pick out that mesoscale detail very much. You can kind of connect the precip areas and kind of surmise that it might be right in there. You can also see that in the cloud field, some evidence of maybe a boundary in there. But this is a synoptic model plot, so it's not really going to key in on those details very much. And up to the northwest, there's that front indicated by the packing of the thickness lines, the thickness gradient right there, and the pressure gradient as well. 
All right, so let's go through the overnight hours. We're going to see that band of showers and storms moving on up into Illinois. Meanwhile, we get the nocturnal shutdown of precip in Florida, and most of the activity appears to be offshore. All right, so we go into tomorrow. Let's run that up to tomorrow night. There's where we're at around peak heating. Looks like some boundaries right there along the Red River. We do have a SPC slight risk for Durant, Lake Texoma, Paris, Clarksville, McKinney, and Denton. So that will bear watching. Looking for some possible hailstorms and some gusty winds as well. But Friday will be the big day. Let's run that up to Friday's map. Yeah, a little nocturnal MCS right there in Oklahoma. And that kind of dies out during the afternoon. And then we get things recharging. And it looks like some storms up there around South Dakota. And this map does not really show it, but possibly some convection all the way down into Kansas as well. Yeah, Friday, looking at some possibilities there in Nebraska. And on the East Coast, we've got the, that other system right there moving on up into North Carolina. That crosses inland late Friday and starts dying off as we get some of the frictional effects tearing it up and maybe some entrainment of dry air. And also, it's losing the evaporation and heat from the Gulf Stream waters. And then we've got that frontal system out there in the plains. There it is right there. System looking kind of like that. Maybe not really sure where the warm front is. But the cold front sinking south and it's not very strong. The pressure gradient's back behind it. Not very impressive. Most of the dynamics remaining up to the north, close to the upper level low. And just not very much down in the central plains. And I figured I'd show a few old photos. That's me back in weather school, the very first weeks I was in. That's my roommate doing weather analysis homework. And of course, I had to do some as well. And we used to have to march to school and back, even in thunderstorms. And that's a shot of me in the mirror there. My first duty station was the Tonopah Test Range. I could not tell anybody about it at the time because they were just coming out, out of uh, black world status there. But this is Nellis Air Force Base. I was assigned to the dorms and then got put out into an apartment off base. Because it was a sensitive assignment, they did not want any Air Force members at Tonopah fraternizing with the people at Nellis. And that's where I lived during my first year in the Air Force. And that's me with one of my roommates at that apartment. And that was my other roommate. They were both weather specialists up at Tonopah. And every week we flew up in these airplanes. Typically the flight would depart, say, Monday morning around 5 or 6 a.m. And then it would return back to Nellis on Thursday evening, like about 6 or 7 p.m. And typically they had about 10 or 20 of these flights every day during the week and maybe two on the weekend. And there's a group shot of us before we split up and went our separate ways. The first F-117 up there on a plinth. And what I've got circled there is me in green. The blue people are the weather people there at Tonopah and the rest of the people are their families and friends. Fantastic people, a great assignment and that was by far my favorite duty station when I was in the Air Force. Very unique experience. So unfortunately I don't have any photos from there, but it was a 30 by 50 building with a forecast and observation section. And maybe one of these days I'll show you a sketch of what the inside looked like. Anyway, that's going to be it for this edition of Forecast Lab. This is going to be some old footage from 2021. Hope you have a great Wednesday evening. Take care and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.